Welcome to the Soul of Islam radio podcast with Ahmed Saqamini and Emil Ihsan Alexander Tarabi. The Islamic Renaissance is here and now. May the peace, the mercy, the blessings, and the light of the divine be upon you all. My name is Ahmed and I'm a researcher in atomic molecular optical physics a spoken word artist and deeply committed to sharing the fundamental connection between science and spirituality with our community and beyond. Ihsan is a lifelong student of Islamic spirituality and the founder and creator of the highly acclaimed Islamic Meditation and Eternal Warrior Way programs. He is a spiritual coach, writer, and speaker committed to the evolution of consciousness within the global community. The Soul of Islam radio podcast is dedicated to sharing the deeper dimension of Islam and supporting your personal growth and spiritual development. Today's podcast is very special, alhamdulillah. In it, we will be interviewing a very special guest. Her name is Sheikha Maryam Kabir Fay. She is a beautiful soul, a seeker of the truth, a walker of the path, a world traveler, a writer, and an artist. She's also known for her profound autobiography, Journey Through 10,000 Veils. The book is a personal account of her extraordinary journey, a journey of surrender inspired and guided by divine will on the path of spiritual transformation, remembrance, and return to the divine presence. The book has won numerous awards and has been recognized by many to be spiritually fruitful for those who are sincerely seeking the truth. We are very pleased and excited to have her here with us. Sheikha Maryam, Assalamu Alaikum and welcome to the Soul of Islam Radio. Alaikum Assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Thank you so much. I'm very blessed to be sharing this time with you and with everyone who is in our circle tuning in, and we send love to each and every one. Alhamdulillah. And of course, uh, joining me to interview our special guest is my friend and dear brother, Ihsan. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. It is so good to be here with you, Shaykh Maryam, and it's such an honor and pleasure to see you again. MashaAllah, our first meeting was filled with blessings and light and a beautiful divine presence. We are truly looking forward to sharing some of your insight, your wisdom, and your experiences with our audience here. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim bismillahir rahmanir rahim So inshallah, the best way I feel to begin is if you can share with us and the listeners all over the world a little bit about your background, cultural, ethnic, maybe spiritual, and maybe your very first spiritual encounter, inshallah. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan Nirajim, Bismillahirrahman, Nirahim. The story of my life is a mirror to your life. And it's a message that is resonating between souls on the journey to God. All of us are fellow travelers engaged in the pursuit of of what God has willed for us and of what He wishes us to do in coming to know him, in coming to know ourselves, in order to know him. And um, I happen to be born in Hollywood, (laughs) of all places, uh, about 68 years ago. And from the very beginning of my life, the signs of Allah were manifesting for me, as I believe they are for all of us. It's a matter of whether we are enabled to perceive them whether we can see or not see that what God is showing us and what he's manifesting is, is manifested in all forms of nature and in, both in the horizons and within our hearts and souls. So as I describe in the book, from the very beginning of my life, the signs were descending, the amazing experiences were happening. Um, when I, I feel it, I felt it in the cradle I felt it with the first steps that I took and with um, the experiences of life as they manifested, you know, one by one. There was always like another presence in the room. 
<laughs> in other words, I might be talking to someone, but who else was there really, you know, touching my heart and soul? And so that was, it was pre-Islamic illumination. I'm speaking about it now because I want to inspire or, you know, suggest, humbly suggest that people pay attention to their own life story and to the, to the relationship most important that we have had with our Creator that has come to each of us in different ways. Um, now, I was born in an agnostic Jewish family, very dedicated to helping other human beings, uh, very committed to racial equality and to uh, human harmony. And so I learned from my family to care for all lives as my own. This was a gift from God. This is, was led me to understand the real truth about Islam, the truth about the Sufi path. So each of the things that you experience, both what you think is negative and positive, are leading you to the light of God. And it's a matter of how conscious we are on the journey, to the, how much of a conscious traveler we become. And I felt that I was a conscious traveler at a very young age. So because of that awareness alone, um, when I write the book, I, I had so many things to say about, about the journey from the very beginning. Why? Because it was revealing itself. And young children are often getting very clear signs, and then the world intervenes and tells us what we should be thinking and what we should be feeling. And it's generally a very false narrative. And so as you go on, you are struggling between what your soul is showing you and moving you towards that love, that beauty, that grace that you mentioned to begin with. That love, that beauty and grace are all uh, what we came here to know. Allah says in the Quran, we did not create men and jinn, but to worship, to love, to love and worship and serve that infinite reality. So it's a matter of your, the steps that you have to take in your individual or collective journey to realize what it means to worship God. Now what about when you're living in a family that doesn't even acknowledge the existence of God? Nobody talked about God to me. The word, when the word God was mentioned, it was associated with religion somewhere else, out the door, <laughs> not inside the house. But inside of my heart, this presence was so great that I didn't know what to call it. I didn't know what to say it was, you know, but it, it kept, you know, sustaining and guiding me. Um, I was at a very young age doing a lot of art, painting, writing, and acting. I was an actress at the age of five, and then I was acting in a, a theater company at 12, and very illuminated by that process in the sense that I found that everyone in the audience was part of me, and that we were now here to share this experience, and that, that experience has continued to unfold, um, that all lives are interconnected, that we're speaking to each other back and forth in order to figure out what is the meaning of our existence. Now, if in this world, if the leaders of the world spoke to each other in that way, to say, what is the meaning of our existence? Why were we created? How can we share with each other this, the grace of our true nature so that we can build a, a wonderful world in which every other living being will feel comfortable and at peace? So through the arts, I learned that at a young age. I learned that I could express these mysteries that were manifesting in my heart, that they would go from my heart to another heart and come back. And this happened in the theater quite a lot. You know, I would be sp on the stage and the words would be coming through, just flowing through. And I saw the, the audience awakening and responding. Until now, if I walk into a market, it happens with the cashier, it happens with the people online. So many things take place that come from sharing the beauty of our existence with our fellow beings. So that was happening to me, especially through theater in the early days. And uh, I had, there was assistant director in the company who handed me 
a scroll one day. So I say the scroll just unfolded. It just kind of expanded in front of me, this message. And it had an ancient man with a long beard and a staff and lantern. And it said, seek and the truth shall make you free. Sixty years later, I found a picture of that again. I, I lost the picture, but I kept the truth of it. But the p picture came back. It was actually the hermit from the tarot, that ancient seeker. So at the age of 12, I realized very clearly that the ancient seeker was myself. That was the definition of my being. I was not some, you know, uh, young girl, actress, star of a play or anything else. Nothing meant anything to me except seeking the truth, the liberating truth. And it was just definitive and it never changed. You know, so now in my room, I have that picture just there sitting, you know, of all the images. It just reminds me of the guide that came to me at that age. And the truth about my life from that point on is that I was literally guided from one to another to another of those ancient beings. And every one of them was waiting for him. Not me personally, but all of us. And they were waiting to download this knowledge to send these messages into the world. One of them was 135 years old or so they say. Uh, that was my first sheikh in Jerusalem. My beloved sheikh in, in Philadelphia, Sheikh Baal Mahayadeen, was maybe 150. And after that, I was led to some marvelous African sheikhs when he left the world uh, until today when I'm a sheikha in the order of Sheikh Mustafa, radiallahu anhu, under the guidance of Sheikh Harun, Rashid Fai, al-Fakir. And all of these guides together have, have been a, um, my companions in the deepest sense, teaching what I call higher education in the deepest sense. Uh, I did not graduate from college. My son is now going for his PhD. And he said to me, Mom, you had to go get that knowledge so that you could give it to me. Now I will be able to learn things in a different way. But what I'm talking about when I say higher knowledge is that knowledge which leads us to the highest reality that we can achieve. And Allah is infinite, subhanahu wa ta'ala. His, his, the depth and breadth of that knowledge is infinite. We may have a drop from that ocean, but it's more valuable than anything. All the knowledge is in every drop of the ocean. So the message is uh, that I learned, would transmit through my life story is that life, our life is a journey. We're being guided by the greatest wealth of truth, there is no other knowledge that compares with it. And all that we have to do is willingly accept the guidance and seek it. Seek the truth that will set us free. And as it comes, once you've made that intention, the truth comes and showers you with grace. Don't forget to be where you need to be in order to receive these blessings. Because once you've made the commitment, Allah knows that you are serious and he will give you the knowledge, minute to minute, day by day. So do not become distracted by worldly events and lose your focus and leave your kibla and you know become afraid of things that are completely illusory that are taking place in the illusory world. But keep returning back to that the divine presence which is with you, which created you to worship. So that's my my suggestion, but it comes in different forms to each person on the journey. So we can talk about, you know, more details of, of how it was revealed to me. But I personally do not want people to focus on me. I'm just a spokesperson of the journey. I'm a, like a, a messenger of the message of the journey. You know, I'm just re sending out that light of my deep love into the world that love that's inspired by the one who is beloved to us all. So if we join together as companions on this holy path, and we are, and we have, that's why our meetings have been so 
wonderful. More and more souls around across the earth can join with us, and they're waiting. They're waiting for the news. They're waiting for that good news to come and say, come, we're on a caravan here. Come, join us. Let's travel together. And what that means is that in the middle of the night, you wake up, you can call me, you know, and, and I will call you to say, yes, God is reminding us again exactly what we heard before, but let's go deeper into it now. In other words, you read the Quran, if you read one ayah and it resonates with you, you still have to keep reading it and, you know, share that wealth of grace with it. In other words, dive deep into the practices, dive deep into the prayers. It's not a superficial matter. It's not a ritual. It's not an empty ritual. It's the deepest possibility that any human being has to discover the, the purpose for which it was created, that we were created. So that's all of these steps are part of the realization. You know, sometimes you come to a great difficulty in your journey and you cannot see, and they call it sometimes dark night of the soul. And you need friends on the journey to remind you one, you've been traveling a very long time. You're not lost. You're not losing your way. But you have to go through the night to get to the day. You have to go up the mountain to see the next illuminated horizon of your journey. And if you want to say, how long is the journey? It's endless. So what fellow travelers do is say, let's say I have in my backpack some important, you know, nourishing tools for you, some healing tools and food and love and knowledge and understanding. You see someone on the journey, they're starting to flag. It's too hard. And then you're, you may sit down at an oasis with that fellow traveler. Give them what you have to sustain them. And they will become strong again and say, yes, of course, I'm not giving up. It's, I, I must, you know, get to the goal. So that's what I think we say to each other, if you feel a little tired, don't stop there. Don't stop there. Suppose the world comes and tells you some really serious untruths. Don't believe them. Don't believe them. Don't listen to the television um, as if you can avoid it, you know, unless there's something you need to learn. But instead, uh, go back to the source of knowledge and listen to what God is saying to you. MashaAllah. Allahumma salli ala Sayyid Muhammad wa ala ali Sayyid Muhammad. Sheikh Amarim, it's inspiring to read your story in your book of how you had the courage and the inspiration to follow your heart ultimately to deeper and deeper experiences of the truth. Oftentimes, especially in today's world, we think that we have to be guided by our minds, by our intellect, by thought and inquiry and study. But you took a radically different approach in your quest for truth. You took a path that was truly soul-inspired. You listened to your heart and soul every step of the way, and you allowed that to guide you. Could you speak to that for our audience regarding the importance of trusting one's heart, one's soul, mm -hmm. and developing a living connection with the Divine Presence, which is always accessible, always imminent, mm -hmm. and allowing that to guide a human being through life, to be able to move through life more through feeling rather than through mm -hmm. thinking, through heart consciousness rather than perhaps mind or ego-based consciousness. Mm -hmm. The innocent child is within us, that clear, radiant heart of that pure soul. And I love the question because it differentiates the different levels of experience and knowledge that we have, that we have experienced in our life. And one of the problems that people have is that at some early point, the child becomes injured and it takes on a trauma. So, and then another. The reason that we take on the traumas is because someone else is traumatized and projects that trauma onto us. So part of the process we're in is definitively trauma healing, trauma healing, you know, so that we can get back to the innocent purity of our true existence. Now, I can't explain why or how this happened, but it was amazing that you picked up on it, that I skipped the sixth grade and I skipped the twelfth grade. I was like, 
what's a, maybe one would say a gifted student. And I went to Berkeley at a very young age um, because whatever was happening in Hollywood and in the Valley and whatever they were teaching in the school was not relevant to me, but I was able to answer the questions on the test. So they, they skipped me. <laughs> I moved on quickly from that. And I arrived um, at, at 16 at Berkeley, uh, UC Berkeley in the 60s. So it was a special time there and then uh, for following your heart, for searching for deeper knowledge. That's what I found at that university at that time. We also had a theater company there. I worked with someone named Abdelhai Moore, Daniel Moore. I met him quite early on, and we formed a theater company, and we were doing kind of rituals, of uh, shamanic-type rituals. Every week I used to go into retreat for several days to purify myself, to continue to play the part that I was playing in the ritual. So I think we were trained in, in shamanic practices without knowing that, and that took us out of, I was going to school in Berkeley, but I really wasn't paying attention to what the university was saying, uh, what the words were on the page. But we were in this process of deep purification and following that inspiration. All of us became Sufi Muslims at the heart of that group. So it was a training ground for Sufi Muslims. Now, even more than that, I wanted to say that when I was a child, these inspirations were coming such as the very fact that a person I can't even find gave me this picture that so affected my heart. It so affected me to see the Ancient One seeking knowledge in the mountains, and the wind was blowing in the beard. And I said, I, as a 12-year-old, am that. Uh, I studied with some great acting teachers, famous acting teachers in Hollywood as a young girl, and the, but then I saw my real teacher as the Ancient One, you know, the one the man of knowledge, the person of knowledge, the person seeking knowledge. Now from that, aligning with that, by aligning with the seeker of knowledge, my heart was opened. My soul was opened to knowledge. So from that point on of seeing that vision, and I want to inspire people to remember the visions that they saw, how the, how the knowledge came to them, or the welcoming, the invitation to higher knowledge came to us. But as I'm saying, it was that's what touched my heart and soul, is not anything that was written in a book or anything intellectual, except that I did read Rumi, and that was wonderful. You know, in the sense I read Rumi, I read the Bhagavad Gita, then I read the Quran in Berkeley. But as for my textbooks, I just didn't read them that much because I couldn't really relate to them. It, it wasn't the knowledge that I needed. But as I was reading those words and dreaming of their meanings... The whole thing started congealing, the vision of the real purpose of a spiritual seeker. At a certain point, our theater company came to a, a conclusion, and I went into retreat in my brother's house in a glass room. I had this puja table with all the, the ancient teachers I knew about sitting there, and then I started dreaming these dreams, you know, of the ancient ones, you know, and so... I, I wrote them down. I wrote everything down in a book. You know, I just kept writing down the dreams and seeing them. Um, whenever I read about a disciple and a, and their master, I knew that it was me, like Milarepa and Rumi. I was reading the stories about the seekers of truth as like a reflection of to what was happening inside of me. You know, and I would just be up in that glass room and these the clouds were like, swirling around me and then the knowledge was just coming in and showing where I had to go, what I had to do. And then at a certain point, that phase was completed. So whenever a phase was completed, I was told very clearly, now move on. Um, I actually was close friends with Ramdas at that time. I would go to his talks. I didn't see anyone. I fasted and was alone almost all the time, but I would go to those talks. And then he would say, he would read from scripture, just what I had written in my journal. And that was a sign. And uh, then we used to do t retreats, and we did a lot of Buddhist meditation, Vipassana meditation, very profound. That was just another p process of what? Cleansing of the inner being. So meditation has never left us. To become a Sufi, you can never forget what you learned as a meditator in any other dimension or practice, because meditation is like at the basis 
and it's each person experiences as they do. But I remember when I was doing that type of meditation, it said impermanent. You would go through your whole body and it said, this is impermanent. Even today, I keep saying to myself, this too shall pass. Any disturbance, this too shall pass. Only the eternal will last. So the knowledge is that we were given, uh, and that piece of knowledge I didn't write in the book, I just remembered it. But in reality, you keep getting, if you're a conscious traveler, each moment of the journey, another dimension of the knowledge comes to you. And it's mostly experiential knowledge which tells you, let go of what is not real so that you can absorb what is truly, eternally real, and it's within you, just like the other thing appears to be. You know, this identity, this ego. Well, in my case, it didn't have too much time to formulate because the power of the message was dispelling it. It was dis disengaging my consciousness from identifying with that. Uh, when I was in Berkeley, I, I walked into the student union one day, and I had been meeting these people, these spiritual people, including Abu Hai, you know, assembling like we do here and now. And um, so we heard on the loudspeaker that our beloved president had died, had passed. And that was the message of death, inevitable as a part of the journey. Very important message and from, at every stage of the way. And at that time, I was friends with someone named Lou Gottlieb, the limelighter. I don't know if you remember him. He was a, folk, a really wonderful folk singer. Mm. So we used to go out on the land where he had um, a farm or something. And as I was sitting there, I started understanding the inevitability of death. I understood the inevitability of death in meditating. And then at another point, I was taken out to the middle of, of a forest. I asked somebody that I was living with just to drop me in the forest. I took only the Tibetan Book of the Dead. You know, well, you see, I'm a Sufi practicing forever in this path, but I had to pass through that. Why? Because everyone must die. Whatever faith you believe in, whatever your training is, whatever your, your guidance is, you must understand the inevitability of death. And so I opened up the Tibetan Book of the Dead and it said, O procrastinating one who thinketh not of the coming of death, devoting thyself to the useless doings of this life. I was maybe 16 years old, and the message was just so radiantly clear until now. It's always being revealed. It's revealed every step we take. Every person, I was saying, do you not realize that everyone you know is going there as, as are, are we? And the question we have at that point that we realize, and for me it was relatively young, but I said, you know, the rest of my life, whatever life I have, I must live in light of this reality, that what, what does it mean to me that I will leave this world? I finally came, little by little, to understand it means that everything you do is so important here. That, and we learned in the Quran, and it said, on that day, every Adam's weight of good you do, you will see it. And every Adam's weight of evil, you will see it. So what happened, as I kept traveling, I went from Berkeley, you know, we, we our, our group came to its completion. I, I met with Ramdas, and he said, go see Neem Karoli Baba, <laughs> who I did see. You know, I ended up meeting a great Lama Kalu in my travels as I was moving along through the mountains and valleys of my journey. Uh, I never followed a map, ever. I, I never went to uh, Expedia. I didn't know where I was going. Only God knew. Allah had was in control. And I got onto the train going, heading east. And it's, I read the Rumi passage, it says it's in the book, and it said, when you get on a train, why do you hold your, keep on holding your luggage? The train is carrying you. You're like a swimmer being carried by the sea. That's what I came to understand as soon as I got on the train, the Orient Express. You're a swimmer carried by the sea. So how could you decide where you're going? So the whole story is like that. And uh, so the Orient Express went and stopped at a certain place, and I got out. And I, I think I stayed in a little rest stop for overnight. You know, different things. I wrote it down in the book, all of these little details of what unfolded next. The deepest impression that came in this phase of the journey was definitely in Afghanistan. And I was overwhelmed by grace in that land. And I've recent, you know, in, in times that have, you know, in recent times, I've spoken to Af groups of Afghans 
young people that have never seen what I saw there. And it's my, my joy to transmit what I saw and experience there so that we know. And right now also, the many of the places that I've been in my journey, which were so radiantly holy and, you know, illuminated, are not that way anymore. It doesn't, you can't see it there. I, you can't see there what I saw then. So the legacy I have to give is of what the true nature of the experience was that I saw there. You feel that with a spiritual teacher who leaves the world, right? You know exactly what I mean. So, you know, like when Bawa was leaving the world, he said to us, you think I'm going? No, I'm entering your heart. I'm going into your heart. So what I saw in each of those holy places that are no longer even visible now has gone into my heart. And it's gone into your heart. It's, it's our heart that is speaking. It's resonating back and forth. What you saw, what I saw, it's all part of what God is revealing to humanity. And it's all been revealed just in these years, in this century. All of this has happened to us. Um, it's very relevant that we're joining together right now at the time when the world is so confused by misinformation that each one of us has received this light from Allah, you know, and been filled with it. It's not something that you read about and then you take notes and turn it into the professor. It's something that becomes you. This light becomes you and has been you and you become conscious that you are that. But your teacher, the teachers you meet are the mirror to you to reflect back to you what God created for you to be. So even when you see me or I see you, it's like that. If you just see, you, it's not about me and you. It's about this, this revelation of God's love and light and wisdom and mercy and grace. And all of us are here to bear witness. What was revealed in, in Afghanistan was that I, I, you see, I got on a bus, but I don't know how I got there. And in every single place, I was passed on to the next vehicle. At one point, I was put in a, a cart. It was an ancient man sitting in the cart. And he said, I will take you to the next place. And he had the face of my teacher from Berkeley, whose name was Harish Jahori. He was just an interesting teacher that I had met in Berkeley Hills. But I see him now in an ancient form in a cart. And he says, get in the cart. I'll take you to where you're going. And that's how I went to the next place. Well, how I got onto the train, I'm, I'm, the, the bus in Afghanistan, they were um, no windows and they were covered with ribbons and, and um, you know, bells and, and they were like from another time, you know, full of that joy and beauty, like the culture of Afghanistan, India, Pakistan, where you can find it still radiantly alive. I, I happen to sell treasures from the Silk Road because I love to keep that alive, that beauty. So I saw it not only in the bus, but in the uh, riders, <laughs> you know, the ancient beings on that bus with their long beards and their turbans and their robes. And everybody just accepted me as completely part of the fabric of it all, as I was. I was never treated as an outsider or a foreigner or a tourist because I wasn't. So here I am on this bus and everyone is like in peace and like doing, making zikr and communicating so peacefully. No war, no sign of war then, nothing, just peace, you know. And so the bus was going along and, um, you know, through the desert. And suddenly the call to prayer came. Now, it was a time before I really knew what the call to prayer was. That's the first time I heard the call to prayer, the beautiful Adhan coming through the desert. And then suddenly the bus stopped and everybody got off. Everyone got off, every single person, including me. And they got off and they all had their prayers and had prayer mats. So they just laid them out in the desert and everyone prayed. Now I was, didn't know what was happening, but my soul knew. It was my beautiful invitation to bow down in the midst of every journey and praise the Lord who created me before it going on with the journey. And so that was, you know, another sign, definitive sign of what Allah willed me to do. And very soon after, I 
I embrace Islam, and from that point on, it's always like that. Every walk of prayer is like that. Every place we go, you know, in, in so many different places, I just lay my prayer mat out in that desert one or another, or, you know, in the hotel or in the <laughs> parking lot. <laughs> and then other people become conscious. But I'm not doing it to sh- I'm only doing it, it's time to pray. But I'll give you an example of what happened in recent years, is that I was doing a show in Delaware um, in a beautiful artist colony called Arden. So I I went, uh, and it's in a place where uh, they have something called Awakened Heart. It's a center for awakening. The lady, uh, the um, kind of minister of that place, wanted to have interfaith. So she looked online to find a Sufi in, in Delaware, but she found me. <laughs> so she invited me, and I came to speak there. And the people were just weeping. So that's another part of the story. It's, it's like returning back with whatever has been given to us to meet whoever is seeking it. Well, at the very same place where all this has happened, I came back to do a show. Um, and I was standing, I was, my tent was in front of Awakened Heart, where all this had happened before. And um, so then, uh, at the end of the show, I went to tuck in behind my tent and do my salat. After the salat, someone came from inside the building and said that was the most beautiful thing. The window was right on the salat. They said, what a beautiful event. This is so once you are manifesting, the people in the desert were not making a demonstration for me. They were praying to their Lord, and that was be, it was bestowed upon me. And in the same way, what we are doing is bestowed upon others. Now, I was standing at the market and uh, some time back, and someone came, I was speaking with a cashier about the path of God, and they always talk to me about it at the Acme market where I go because it has already come to pass that we know we're here for that purpose, at the, even there. So someone came behind me and said, a tiny woman, not Muslim, not covered or anything, I don't know where she came from, not Middle Eastern, she said, what you have said is, is the absolute truth of God, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. And then she disappeared. Now, I was in that same market in line last week. So I came, I was, someone came to me and said, is this an express line? I'm trying to integrate the practical, normal reality with what really is going on. The person came behind me and said, is this the express line? I said, looks like it is. <laughs> well, that broke the ice. So here we are talking to each other. I turn around to see her. She said, do you know Reverend Anne Marie? I said, yes. Then she says, did you speak? Aren't you the Sufi? Aren't you the Sufi uh, that spoke at Awakened Heart? These are people who live in Delaware. They were in... Philadelphia only one day in that market on that line at that day and then she said that they heard they heard the speech and then she said they bought my book and they've been reading it ever since and they've just been overwhelmed and you know they're so happy and and but what is interesting is just exactly how the signs of God descend and how he makes things happen like that continuously not he in any normal sense the one uh, who's in control of everything puts us together she asked me then, do you have, what's happening now with all this negative discussion that's going around the media? She says, do, do people address this to you? Do they, you know, are they negative toward you? I said, not at all. I have not experienced that. And then right at that moment, one of the other um, uh, cashiers came over and said, Mariam, you know, and this is a person who finds me any place in the market and just hugs and embraces you know, and we share love. Now, she's not a Muslim. She's a person who loves the light of God. She loves the light of Islam that she sees in me. So I said, well, that was the proof. She says, wow, everybody knows you here. What they know is what they see. That's why never think that what you're doing is not a sacred opportunity. Never think that you're just going to the market to buy something. That's why I'm talking about this. It just went from from Afghanistan to Delaware to the Acme market in Philadelphia, in Balaginwood, you know, that the transmission continues. And and it has, there's so many, many levels of it. But my point at this moment is the circle, what goes around comes around. So when you make a journey, when you make a journey, you have to go somewhere. It may not be graphically like that. You may not have to go as far as I went or to the places I went. 
But you do have to go somewhere and continue to go on the journey. You know, every day. Every day there's, there are more, more things to learn. That means you die before death. You give your life up to see what new life is coming. He says he takes the earth that is dead and brings it back to life. That's us. That's us. Now, as we're coming back to life day after day, we're giving life. We're called upon to give that life to someone. And my son and I, we're working. We, we work in, in um, what's called either Love Park or City Hall. We do a, a, a month of trading of the goods, you know, in a big international marketplace. And many people have told me, I met someone recently, his, a fellow student in the PhD program, and he already knew about me. He talked to me on the phone, but he said, I know you. I saw you praying at City Hall. <laughs> I saw you praying there. You know, and um, it's so rare. People don't actually see people doing it. We usually hide. Mm-hmm. You know, and other people say, well, I don't take, I met someone on the plane yesterday who had her, was, had her prayer beads, you know, in her hand, but she was a, a Catholic. And I was using my prayer beads. And then finally we started talking about prayer beads and prayer. And she says, I don't like people to see that I'm doing it. I said, it's not bad to let people feel that we're doing it, to pray for them. Let them know they're being prayed for. You know, let's pray together. You know, and I was another point I was going to say is that, so after so many different levels of initiation and training and in different countries of the world, uh, but starting in Jerusalem, where I met my first sheikh, I was coming back on a train from Jerusalem. Uh, So I I was telling you about going abroad, and then I was coming back. And the train stopped um, for four hours or so on the tracks. You know, I've never questioned where or when I should pray. This has never been a question that came to me. It's time to pray. So I went out and prayed um, in a safe place. You know, in other words, not where a train is going to come. And um, at the end of the prayer multitudes of people came and embraced me, weeping. They were just overwhelmed with joy. Um, Later on, recently, a friend of mine came who was actually traveling back with me from Jerusalem, and she said there was at least 100 people there. And where we were, I come to understand later, is in a, a communist country where prayer is illegal. But no one can say that prayer is illegal. Prayer is legal. Prayer is, and to be a Muslim, to be a prayer To be a servant of the infinite grace and mercy is always to be protected, but it's also a sign to everyone that prayer is not only legal, it's necessary. How could you live a life where some leader tells you it's illegal to pray? Or consider the prophets who were, you know, like the prophet Daniel, for example, peace and blessings be upon him, uh, in a kingdom where the king is saying, you can't do this. And, there, and, and, and our, our forefathers have given up their life for it just to, because they have to do it. They have to do it. And we do too. So that's, you know, so then she's asking me, is it hard for you? No, not yet. I don't know. If someone wants to come and cut off my head, I don't know. That would be, if that, that would be following a prophet if it had to happen. I don't believe so, not at this point. And there would be no reason for me to have a gun to protect myself. Never has been. Our protection is our dua. The tool that we have is our prayer. You know, the prayer is what keeps protecting us from everything that can hurt us. And as we have been told, the greatest jihad, the greatest battle is within ourself. So if the prayer itself is protecting us against any external enemy, what about internal? You know, and can we become conscious travelers and know who we're fighting against? And then use, not fear. Fear will not help. (laughs) Anger will not help. Frustration will not help. It will only encourage those forces to keep speaking louder, to shout at you. (laughs) You don't want to do that. Do not shout. Do not shout back at the shouter. But you say, you know, repel what is bad, or someone said, don't say the word repel to me recently, return, to give back to what is negative, what is more and more positive, more and more joy, more and more love, more compassion. So if someone speaks to you in a way, if they should come and say something to you negative, thinking that you are, you know, should be spoken to in that way, 
which rarely happens to people like us, but it could happen, then you have to understand they're traumatized and they're afraid. They may not ta say that you're bad because you're Muslim, but they don't like you <laughs> for some other reason. And then you take it personally, but you shouldn't. We must not take these. These are all tools of the negative force. We could call it shaitan, who has these different techniques, you know, of disturbing people uh, away from going all the way to the goal. It could come at any point in the journey that you get, try to, something tries to distract you. But the more that you know it's absolutely unreal, the more that it can't affect you at all. But if you see one day that you're slightly affected, don't take it seriously. You know what I mean? I say to myself, don't take it seriously. Didn't I, hasn't God rained grace upon me thousands of millions of eons now? And my son says this to me. He said, if I'm worried about something like economic, he says, mom, haven't we always been provided for? It could be. Look at our prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who gave all his food away, except the particle that he needed. He always was sustained. We are always sustained following in his footsteps. Bawa uh, Muhaydin, Sheikh Bawa Muhaydin, when he ate, which was rare, he had a very tiny tray. It was about two inches long with like a few nuts on it. You know, a few nuts and fruit. And that was adequate. That was all he needed. And he knew that he only needed it. And I sat in a Zen session for many days with the great Suzuki Roshi, a wonderful uh, Buddhist teacher. And I was given a little plate like that of, um, um, you know, a little bit of fruit and nuts and found it, that it was completely satisfying. And here we are fasting more and more in our life, pay, experiencing how nourished we are. So this is a, a way of understanding that the things of the world that we think we need, we do not need very much. We need just enough. And we need to know that God is giving us what we need. So we should not be anxious and go around trying to get something that for ourselves, <laughs> you know, and when I came back, so I came back from all of these different experiences. And at one point, uh, and I wrote the book eventually, the book wrote itself. I just saw the words fall on the page or in the computer. The computer itself crashed and then the computer was revived and then the words kept coming. You know, the computer is not, you know, you can't count on the computer. You can only count on the source of, of wisdom and grace and knowledge to keep finding another way of being written down <laughs> and passed on. So I was at, um, my book was chosen as Book of the Month at the Washington National Cathedral a few years ago, along with Eli Wiesel and three other writers. I don't remember who. So there was a group called Daughters of Abraham who read it of all different, both Muslims, Jews, and Christians, and not only women. <laughs> so we had, after they had read it, they, we, we had a meeting at a place called Rumi Forum in, in Washington. And it was, I was interviewed by a pastor, woman pastor. So her first question is something like what you said. She said, weren't you afraid? Weren't you afraid on this journey? You le I had really no money. I didn't travel with money. I mean, I had just a little. I had just a little money to keep going. I don't know how exactly it worked, you know, but I had enough. At a certain point, I was with Maharaji, the guru of Ramdas, and he, said, he told Ramdas, take the money out of your wallet and give it to her. <laughs> That's how I continued to travel. And I entered into spheres and places where people were all waiting for me and they knew me and they, I didn't, it wasn't a question of paying rent, you know? So that perspective opens up that you're on a sacred journey and the places you have to go are prepared for you. Every place you have to go is prepared for you. And if people, you know, equally now, right now we live in a certain city, we drive a car, but the places we're supposed to go are prepared for us. Will we have enough money to get there? Yes. When there, otherwise, we, we don't know where it is, but it comes. There was a story about some Christian saints and they were helping lots of people and they didn't know how they were gonna get the next means and she put her hand, it was about women saints, she put her hand in her pocket, there it was, there it was. You guys know that too. How do you help others? Because God is helping you to help them by giving you the sustenance. But the first level of sustenance is for the soul. If their soul is strong, what 
you know, everything else you need will just come. And when it comes, we remember our holy prophet, he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, did not keep it for himself or his family. He kept giving it. So that's another part of the deen. You know, nowadays, when there's so much negative um, misinformation being circulated, the Muslims, the people, that is, who are surrendered to the wealth of God's grace in the context of Islam, which means peace, Islam, which is peace, have food to offer, feasts to serve in so many different ways. And how I first came into Islam in, in Jerusalem, I was a Jew coming to Islam, in Jer coming to Jerusalem, and it was the Muslims who served me these feasts of grace. Even now, where I'm staying, every night is a feast of grace, and we call it Maida. You know, it's an outspread plenitude. So I'm saying that every bit of nourishment, every kind of nourishment that we have, let it be wisdom, knowledge, love, compassion, food itself, um, and um, all the qualities of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are resonating within you. I was going to say what happened to my son and I when we were at City Hall. I didn't mention that. So we were, you know, in our booth and selling our things and sharing. And we watched a girl walk down the way on, on uh, uh, crutches. She comes to stairs. And she has to go down the stairs on crutches. And my son, whose name is Isa, uh, is, is like a source of endless a kindness and concern for others. You know, he always reminds me, if I ever f could possibly forget, that that person is ourself who just walked by. We both got up and we followed her and we said, where are you going? And so she said, uh, I'm going home. But we said, well, how are you going to get there? You know, she's walking on crutches on stairs. So we carried her down and then um, we took her in the car because how is she going to get on the bus and how is she going to get off the bus? And then when we got her to her house, she has stairs. Well, you have to think about that when you see someone. The, all of the sheikhs that I have been with have always done that, and that is how we live, too. It's that you see somebody like that, you have to give them what you have, the grace you have. We have two feet here. We have arms. We have, um, you know, the, a car. We, can we not help the person who doesn't have that? And two or three weeks later, she came by again, and she was perfectly well. She was so grateful. So I'm just saying that all what I have learned from what every one of the teachers have taught is what God is teaching us about his love. So we cannot keep it for ourselves. We cannot return what is negative with other than love. And that this wealth of provision, I say this to any person who has received this grace, who is listening, including us. So we can't say that okay, now I have what I need, and that's it. No, who needs something today? Who might be um, coming, following you? Who may you meet today? You wake up in the morning and say, who can I help today? How can I serve today? And the service is prayer, worship, love, and then going out and helping your fellow being in every way that you can. But that, that is what service of God is, and that is what worship is. It's not like staying in retreat for 40 years or something, you know, like, uh, or for four years. It's, it's going in, you go into retreat, you receive the knowledge, you have to come right back out again and see, you know, someone crying over there. And I've taught kids many times. I have many classes of kids. I also work in prison every week, which is no doubt what I must do. I'm, I told the kids, be aware of the other kids in school. Take note of who needs your help. And can you? what can you do for that person? And that's how we train ourselves and each other. Sheikh Amiram, you've had so many profound experiences throughout your life. You've gone through so many different practices and teachers. You studied with Guru Ram Das, Suzuki Roshi, and many others. You've practiced meditation, yoga. You've participated in chanting. Yet ultimately, you found your home in Islam. And given the image that Islam has in the world today, mm -hmm. we can't help but ask, why Islam? And what does Islam mean to you? And if you could try mm -hmm. to impart the essence of Islam to people, what would you? how would you describe that? Mm -hmm. What would that mean to them? I love the question. 
And it's a very important question. The root of the word Islam is peace, salam. The way in which I learned it was from beings who were immersed in peace. And they were the manifestation of God's peace on earth. And I did study all of those modalities, let's say in Berkeley, because I was a student of esoteric teachings, you know, so I was, I, and I was searching for knowledge. What was the best path? What was the most, the, the deepest knowledge that I could find? Um, like other people who are seeking and reading this book and reading that book. And as a sincere seeker, when you read something that has truth in it, you feel that, you feel it resonating. Uh, that's why, you know, when I said to you, when I was doing Vipassana meditation, I learned about myself and it resonated with me that some part of my being is attached to things that are impermanent and I've got to let them go. Got to let go of that mind, get let go of, of the attachment to things that aren't real. So that was a real teaching that I never forgot, I never lost. But the journey didn't end there. It didn't end there. Um, so as I was picking up the pieces of scriptures and truths and resonating realities, you know, that were coming into my soul, uh, even the understanding that a person has to go on a journey was very significant. So I read the stories of the seekers because I needed to go on that journey. Now, it is the journey that led me to Islam, the journey led to Islam. Now we're going to describe what Islam did the journey lead to and, and how is it the opposite, as it is, to what is being said today and being done in the name of Islam today. Every one of my teachers was the manifestation of God's love in the deepest sense. Even the ones that were not Muslims, you know, I mean, Suzuki Roshi was, was the manifestation of God's love. That's what I saw and light. But I just was not meant to sit in that zendo for the rest of my life. And when I came to Lama Kalu Rinpoche in India, I was simply guided to him. But he was so beautiful and so holy, and he, he was a holy, holy person. While well, I sat in his small, like, magnificent room of grace, and he bestowed the grace upon me. He gave me a name. It was Mother of Compassionate Wisdom, Karma Paulden Dolma. And the grace just poured down upon me, and, you know, at the same time that the grace was coming, the message came, you can't stay here. You must continue the journey. Your journey is not over. Because there were people from the West, just two or three, sitting there who were Buddhists for the rest of their life. And recently, Issa and I were working on his master's uh, thesis. It was on the Buddhist peace response to the uh, Vietnam War, you know. And so, until now, how much I re appreciate the, the people who responded to that war with peace. And how much is that a part of me? It is. But... I wasn't meant to continue. When I was sitting in that room with the Buddhist master, the message came, you can't stay here. This is not ultimately your path. Then I was with, I was guided to Russian Orthodox Christian Catholic monastery, um, ecumenical monastery, where I lived for quite a while in Belgium and then in the French, French Alps with wonderful people, very holy people. And uh, I learned a great deal just praying there and they knew me and they knew why I was there. It was, they told me that. <laughs> they had been told that I had to come and be there. So that's, um, and then they just, the knowledge was bestowed there. You know, like I was in retreat for 40 days. She said, my mother superior said, you um, do not have to do anything here. You came here to worship. They said, the, she said, the other sisters, they were going to work around the house. Not you. God and Mary and the, Jesus have told me why you're here, to worship. And I sat in a room for 40 days looking at Mount, the white Mount Blanc, Mont Blanc, you know, in the French Alps. And all that happened, you know, that relationship with Isa alayhi salatu salam, internally, internally, that peace, that, and the purification, and the understanding of the scripture that I read there, of him, of how he walked on the earth. And then I ended up in Jerusalem, living on the mountain where he walked. <laughs> profoundly affected by that. When I arrived in Jerusalem, I actually went with Sheikh Nuruddin and Nura um, to write a book, but I just by God's grace did I know that I should do that. I, I ended up at Lama Foundation and met him in the garden, and he said, I'm going to Jerusalem to write a book on Jerusalem. And I was carrying in my hands 
a huge tome that I carried with me all around the earth, painting and writing all these dreams and messages. So I walk in with this tome, of having been writing and <laughs> painting, and he says, I'm working on a book, and I'm looking for who's coming together. And it was obvious to us both that I must go. So I went there, and the first week I lived in that on the Mount of Olives, it was with my mother superior who turned up on the same day, and her spiritual father, and he was giving a course on the book of Revelation on the Mount of Olives. So I was in that state of perception, awareness, in grace. And then after that was over, I was sitting at Damascus Gate with a prayer shawl enveloping me, and a young man approached, and he said, aren't you Mary from California? I said, yes, I'm Mariam. And he said, my grandfather is waiting for you. And that's how I met my first sheikh, whose name was Sheikh Abdul Mutalib. And um, within a week, so I brought him back to the house where Nordin, Nora, and others were gathered, including uh, Abdul Latif, who made the movie Ghazali, a beautiful soul, and many other, just a small group of beautiful people writing a book. And um, so a week later, I went with this young man, Hassan al Sharif, and Sheikh Nordin and Abdul Latif to meet the grandfather, Sheikh, Sheikh Abdul Muttalib. And we, we at first we went to the Mosque of Abraham, alayhi salatu salam, and upon entering the mosque, I just bowed down completely. You know, I just utterly prostrated. I didn't know why or what it was. It was just total, you know, <laughs> powerful descent of grace. That's what we can say. And then, so then we went, walked on these ancient lanes, El Khalil, the place of the friend. We walked down the ancient lanes and upstairs and downstairs to this zawiya of Abdul Muttalib, Sheikh Abdul Muttalib, radiallahu anhu, and uh, walked down in the deep into it, which covered with flowers on the walls. And then we sat down. It may have been a zawiya of a great Sufi, I, I heard. And um, so we sat down with the grandfather, we called him, we met him, and a small group of his disciples. He was, as they told us, 135, and he did look like it. He was wearing like um, a jacket, a coat to the ground, and a towel, and just radiating light and purity and grace. And so he, we all sat in that circle. They were doing Ya Latif. They were doing the Zikr Ya Latif. And it just went on and on. There in the Holy Land, Ya Latif just enveloped everything. It enveloped my being entirely. I was lost forevermore in that grace. Nothing else, nothing else. I mean, how did I become a Muslim like that? You know, because the radiance and the resonance was filling all, all of my being. And it was the direct transmission from him to my soul. And he was waiting there to do to for that to happen. He did send his grandson to get me. So he was a man of deep knowledge and had called me there. Now, when we completed our session and he told us about his teaching, I think that he was a Rafai, actually, um, but probably in a very different sense than anyone has ever seen. He, he was so, I mean, he wasn't like restricted at all by, by concepts. You know, he was just emanating pure existence of God's grace. And so every, the, uh, Sheikh Nuruddin and Abdul Latif came to the door and at the end and were walked out but somebody came to the door and said that the sheikh had said would I please move in to the zawiya so I just went back to the Mount of Olives and got my things and moved in and so he wasn't didn't sleep he had a bed you know but he didn't sleep in it so he he put me in the bed you know I slept in his bed and he started blowing on me prayers throughout the day and night and during that period of the dreams were coming and the first dream is, I'm not sure if I've mentioned it here, but the first dream was, I, I told you I think earlier today, was that I was in a cave. I was sent to a cave and was to do a 40-day retreat. I never heard about a 40-day retreat. You see, it is a true practice, a Sufi practice, but I learned about it in my dream. And so I was in the, doing that purification. It says, you have come here to make peace between two nations. So you have to do a 40-day retreat for peace. Okay, I was a Jew. I was becoming a Muslim at that moment in time, so to speak. The truth is, it's all one thing. There is no separation between any of the prophets, neither the Jewish or the Muslim. This is something very important that we need to 
understand, you know, that we do understand. But at that point, I was just learning about it in my dream. So I'm sitting there in retreat, and I've done since then many halwas, which have been very crucial to my development, but that was the first one in the dream. Eventually, someone finally, after the 40 days, knocked on the door. When you're in a halwa, you can't see anyone until the halwa's over. So he knocked after the 40th day. The door opened, and then he said, I'm a messenger of the king, and he's asking for your hand in marriage. But in order to make the marriage, you have to jump off a cliff. So that was the dream. I went to the grandfather, and I said the dream. And he said, the king is Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The king is Muhammad. The messenger was a messenger of the messenger. So he is asking for your hand in marriage. In order to make the marriage, you have to make the salat. In other words, jump off the cliff. Let go of everything you've ever known. You can't come with a full cup. You have to have empty cup. And bow down and give up everything. Jump off the cliff. And I said in my book one phrase, I jumped off the cliff and I found that I could fly. That's what happened. You know, that's exactly what happened. And so that was the first time I made Salat. And then I was praying in this little cave with the men on one side and the lace curtain and the women on the other only, I mean, maybe two women, myself and his wife and and maybe four men. (laughs) And they were all at least a (laughs) hundred or so. Oh, but his grandson, Hassan. And um, that's where I began to pray. So, and from that point on, all that I'm saying now and many, many, many more things about my experience as a Muslim is what makes me understand why I am a Muslim and what Islam contains. Um, We can also say that the Sufi dimension of Islam is very important. And if people do not understand that, they they may not have what's called taqwa to understand what the Quran is saying. Because the Quran tells us, Allah tells us in the Holy Quran, that the Quran is revealed as guidance to those who have taqwa. So taqwa is the awareness that we're existing in the presence of God. The sheikhs that I have been with all my life, and even the people I have met in the marketplace are those, you know, in afterwards. In other words, when I come back from these holy journeys, we come back into a place where people are needing it. But the people who resonate or come to us are living in the presence, or they would not recognize that in us. And they sometimes say to me, oh, you're so beautiful. But I know that it's not me. It's the beauty of Allah. It's the beauty of God's grace that is now being reflected back and forth. And that's what Sufism teaches us. And it's the true nature of Islam. It is that peace. What peace is Islam? It's the peace that descended to the earth before anything existed. It's the light of the Prophet that existed before anything existed. It's not about a religion that is fighting with another religion. And it's never to do with killing innocent people. It's about bring, saving lives. <laughs> We're here. Islam is here to save lives. Every, and when I walked, I was walking through the airport yesterday in Philadelphia, and there was a huge mural on the wall, and it said, it said, Holy Quran and Talmud. And it put a quote, and it said, if even one life is slain, it's like all of humanity was slain that was quoted on the wall of the airport in Philadelphia. That's a sign to humanity uh, now that this must be stated and manifested. Not only do you save people from dying, you save them to live. You give them water of life, water of grace, wisdom, wisdom. What should happen is that we go to those places in Afghanistan where people are being misinformed and have circles of wisdom, you know, like to show them the beauty of their existence or find ways that they can make a living. The people who get caught in the dark um, realms of misunderstanding, which is covering up the truth, it's kufr, and start to think that Islam is anything else but that, that it is a, a religion where if you do violent acts, you will become well-known and famous and, and victorious. Are, it's the greatest sign of dis- misinformation and covering up the truth. So the question we have now, and I was answering it a little bit about, for one thing I say uh, about myself, is that I always cover my head 
um, I was also told by my first shake, I showed him a picture of myself um, in the earlier days, and he said, oh, he was blind. He was blind, my beloved first shake. But he said, it's a beautiful picture, but why isn't your head covered? You know, and Bawa, Sheikh Bawa said to me, um, he wants my headscarf was a little bit, you know, a little bit loose or kind of falling off, and he said, but how will Jesus recognize you, Mariam? And, and I'm saying this for a reason, not to make any cult of it. It's a reason, because now I've understood it myself. So then another t- someone said that um, it's like a mantle that fell from the sky upon your head. And then we think about our mothers in, in the deen, in our four, you know, the four bearers of the deen as, who were women, and how I, I think that I am dressing like them and acting like them and trying my best to follow their examples uh, without really understanding what that means exactly. But, what, you know, because I feel them guiding me, you know, I feel that force of the eternally gracious peace and love of the people who walked before us, men and women, um, believers, men and women, but that includes Mariam, whose name has been given to me. Um, now, what I'm explaining is that that if we do not reveal that we're Muslims, you know, in, in that normal, simple way, such as that, it could be, you could do it without that, you can, you know, let people know it another way, but for me, I'm communicating um, th- this in a variety of ways. That's one. Another one is to be merciful at all times, that you can always show mercy, and then that's how people find out what Islam is about, that it's merciful. It's from the merciful, and it's nothing but mercy. Now, having heard that, and seen that, and felt that, experienced that, and you see in the world today what you asked in your question, the manifestations of mercilessness that are crossing the earth right now, both in action and in, in uh, reference to the action. You know, we have people doing things that are absolutely the opposite of Islam, being called Islamists. And so the media is both fostering that misunderstanding and also trying to figure out what's happening. I saw this on CNN a few nights ago. They were trying to figure out. They were interviewing the Muslims to find out what does Islam really say? You know, what did what is the history of Islam? What what and we have the example of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his diplomacy, his, and that he was sent but not but his mercy. Now, number one, it's an example for us. Number two, a perfect example. And number two, we have to share this knowledge, um, not only by speaking up like this, but by just loving all lives as our own as we meet them on a daily basis. You know, as we're making our salawat, walking down the street, let the salawat extend in action, in love, kindness, and then see after, you know, oh, I was saying about Afghanistan, of course, I'm not rushing over there. No, I know that it's, it's not like it was when I was there. It's different now. But I'm saying, where are the potential youth, the youth who could go one way? Can we bring them back, please? Can we bring them back, those people who could be such great uh, servants of the good, you know, but they've been misinformed and, and terrorized themselves? They have unhealed traumas. The people, for example, in Palestine, the young people, what opportunities do they have that we have? Can we share the opportunities that we have with them? That's my point. In other words, look for the opportunities of sharing that grace and in order to, to pull people away into the grace. You know, in other words, welcome them including the people that are on the edge, like people getting bullied in school, or people who think that are being told that Islam is evil and that they're afraid of it, you know? And in the meantime, uh, we, what can we do about that? I ask each other, I ask you and myself, you know, what a love can we show, including on, uh, in groups like you have? And so we're going from this point right now where our whole life, yours and mine, has brought us through these beautiful steps of a journey 
to the moment where we're actually assembled, not alone, because the awliya are all with us. Do they not want us to succeed with them as our source and sustenance, you know, our energy? Each one of us, we may have experience with different tarikas. Even I have experience with different tarikas. But the, the founders of those tarikas are with me today. They're all in agreement. They're, they agree that we must do this work of manifesting mercy upon this earth, each and every one of us, and gather together in circles like you're doing and include invite people like me, and then we figure out if we make um, interviews like this, send them into other places in the world and ask people to answer. You know, I'm going to give my email address right now. It is Baraka, B-A-R-A-K-A-H, at verizon.net. And um, when people hear this, let's, let's, you know, hear what they have to say, you know, and compile the information and say, how can we uh, shift this paradigm collectively, you know, on, on this very earth at this very time? SubhanAllah, we feel that we're just barely scratching the surface here in this interview. Now, there is a shift of consciousness taking place in the world, especially in this time. And it almost feels like a, a divine hand is in place. It's moving things. It's calling upon those who are sincerely seeking the truth, reality, for what it really is. And... Many of those seekers are scattered all over the world. Is there some sort of vision for us as mm -hmm. seekers to connect and network and build and move forward and really reflect the light and the beauty of Islam into the world? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. That is the vision. You just stated it. And I think that we are, while we watch the confusing imagery coming across the screens of you know, the televisions and the, the world and the minds of people in the world, we're, we're beholding another vision. And that vision is getting stronger and stronger, internally and collectively, individually and collectively. That is why what we're doing right now, that's how we're meeting. We're meeting in that, for that, by that, because of that. Like exactly as you said, God's hand is willing us to reunite in the light. Um, I wanted to mention that where we met was at a conference dedicated to the peacemakers, which was organized by um, a, the, the Muridi Atarika that I have and am a part of uh, in my heart, in my deep heart. And um, I wanted to mention Sheikh Ali, who is presently in Senegal, um, as the country also of Sheikh Haroun, the holy country of Senegal. And um, I have spent been there 14 times, and I'm greatly in love with it and um, dedicated to the truths that have manifested there as elsewhere. Uh, and one of the great saints of that um, of that country is Sheikh Ahmed Abamba, radiallahu anhu. And I also have spent a great deal of time with Sheikh Bawam Haidin, who I feel is a great saint, uh, radiallahu anhu, a teacher, Qutub, and um, that I happen to live across from the fellowship where I take care of an elder in need, and that's what God has willed for me. Uh, and um, I frequently go to South Carolina and, and do the most beautiful zikrs uh, in the masjid there with Sheikh Haroon and in honor of his uncle who gave us that wealth from another tariqa, that is the Mustafa Wiya tariqa. And um, what I see right now, I feel deeply, is unity, unification, and joining together. At that conference, uh, it was dedicated, uh, the dedicated conference we met at was dedicated to the peacemakers, uh, many of the peacemakers that we have seen in our own world, um, such as Gandhi and Sheikh Ahmed Ubamba, radiallahu anhu, and Mother Teresa. These are uh, symbols. They are symbols of human beings on the face of the earth, who said, who said no to war, mm -hmm. who said no to destruction mm -hmm. of the planet hopelessly and purposelessly, who said yes to the care of 
how many living beings we may meet in our life. It doesn't mean that we agree with each and every one of them exactly in the details. Mm -hmm. You know, um, for, I may not agree with the, 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 even the religion that they followed, but what I agree with is uh, the heart and essence of the teaching that is pouring through anybody who wants to make peace on this earth, anyone who treats another life with mercy, love, kindness, and and sustaining um, uh, knowledge and grace, uh, food if need be. We have the example of Muhammad Yunus in Bangladesh who who saw didn't just give up on the culture, which was dysfunctional in certain ways. Women were disempowered, and and instead of giving up on them, he found a way, a secret formula to transform that world that he was in, the world in which he lived, where the women became empowered just with a little loan to make a business work. They had a little loan in their hand, and it made their business work. And that's an example. I was referring to it earlier. And the, those walkers on the face of the earth are examples not by themselves. They are um, beacons of light, as were even more deeply and, and, and you know, divinely the prophets. Peace and blessings be upon all of them, all united, none that can be separated from another. Now, the problem we're having in, the, in all these wars, uh, particularly the religious wars, is that these religions are saying, my prophet is better than your prophet. But in reality, all the prophets are united and God is the only one the great the one great God of all now the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to complete that level of prophecy that all the prophets came to bring and many of them were not accepted they were not accepted but except by a few you know now in this particular time we are asking our Lord that more and more people accept what the prophets brought to mankind. And after the prophets, alayhim salatu salam, the, what we call the awliya, the lovers of truth, the lovers of God, who have come onto the earth to continue this work. And it's an unbroken line, a transmission of grace. So each one of us has received it in a different way. And what we want to do is is create a reservoir of of grace that is that we share, and it is God's grace. It's not our grace. We're like holding holding this reservoir in place, and that grace is just resonating. That's what happens in a zikr. That's what happens in halwa. That's what happens when even it says two or more are gathered in my name. There I am. Okay, so I was saying that at every level of my journey, I learned something. I learned that at an earlier time. Two or more are gathered in my name, there I am. I will not forget that truth, but will manifest it again and again with two, three, four, five, <laughs> as, many, as many beings that, as yearn for this wonderful transformation. And it begins within, and it extends to the farthest reaches of, of the universe. Um, let the glory of God manifest as he wills. Let us not be um, uh, resistant to the manifestation of his will through us. Let us not um, think that we are responsible for our own existence or that we can do anything but give our entire life back to him and ask for him to use us uh, for this purpose of that that he created us for, and that purpose is manifesting at this time in this gathering of souls. So um, I I want to express my deepest joy and gratitude to the source of all bounty that we can even sit right here right now, and that when we go from here to the next place we will again be guided, as I have been all my life, but we will, each and every one of us, be guided to another soul, another person um, in need of 
um, giving and receiving this beauty and grace. And so that's the, the kind of um, dynamic that we're in. And we're actually praying deeply for guidance about how Allah wishes us to manifest uh, daily, you know, and every day is a miracle in that context. You know, every day that you sincerely ask, imagine and see what goes on in that day. You know, I knew that I was coming here today, but I didn't know what this meeting would be like, you know, as I was traveling in the car, but how deep it is, you know, how deep our connection is. And then, you know, it goes beyond that, including that when you're on a spiritual journey, you go from one uh, martaba to the next one. So we're going, we're going from one stage to another or station to another, individually and collectively. So even when we're not physically together, but you are in your kibla, and each one of us is in our, you know, community, we're totally linked in this, in this work of, of, you know, sharing this grace, of resonating with it, and, and being guided by it to one level after the next, as God wills. Mashallah, it's been such a joy and pleasure and honor to have you here with us, Sheikh Maryam. And uh, that divine light is flowing from your heart to ours, and we hope that it's going to reach, inshallah, everybody that listens to this podcast. One last question I had, and we want to kind of point people back to your book, which has been published and an excellent read. Your autobiography is entitled Journey Through 10,000 Veils. Maybe briefly, if you could just tell us why you chose that as mm-hmm. the title for that book. The book is actually called Journey Through 10,000 Veils, The Alchemy of Transformation on the Sufi Path. And so the second part of the title is actually more significant to me. And I, I had come back on a long trip and arrived in Santa Barbara and walked into Whole Foods and the name came to me. I don't really know what it truly means except that we are in a journey and we're going through, you know, as I, it's related to what I just said, that one station after the next, we're on a journey. So you penetrate the veil of one station or the, you know, whatever you have to get through to see what you next see. You may be walking up a mountain, it may be kind of difficult and demanding, but when you get to the next level, you see the horizon in a totally different way. And that's what my story is about, and it's about the story of each of us. Every sincere seeker is going to be on a journey like that. You know, so the word journey is crucial <laughs> to the title and to the book. Um, most people who read the book feel that it's simply a reflection of their own journey, and that is what I wish it to be. And I would advise everyone to write a book or, you know, not necessarily write the book, but but read the book <laughs> of your own life. Mm-hmm. Read the book that God has given you that is the story of your life and glean the, the jewels of wisdom that he has planted in your journey. In other words, not one moment was wasted. Not one moment have you been just, you know, gone and lost and in vain. Right after you were going through that kind of dark night, you come to the end of that and you see something that you never saw before. So every, every moment of your life is sacred. Every moment of our life is sacred. And it's that unity with God. It's turning to God. It's believing. It's believing in, in the presence of God. It's breathing it in. It's giving and receiving from that relationship. There is no relationship that in any way compares to that. That's the marriage of souls with the source. You know, and if we're waiting for something else, it will never satisfy us. It's only, I mean, because who we really are can only be completed in such a way. We can only be completed by that, you know, complete presence of the divine. So the way that you, it says, you have to know yourself to know God, to come to know, to come to go know the mysteries of God. For that reason, you have to read your own book. You have to study your own book. What did the divine tell you when you were born? 
or at the when you were a small child you start to have memories that come back to you about this relationship and gradually it, it fills your heart you know how much God loves you how much he has given you and what will he give you now that you are conscious that you're a conscious traveler more and more conscious you know of the grace that he's been bestowing upon you all along you know and now it goes to when you see the saints and how they manifest and they say these miracles are nothing <laughs> the miracle is nothing compared with the miracle of God that is is like now like forever now and then and forevermore the, the true nature of your being you just have to get behind yourself for sure you know this limited being this this body will go into the ground you know alhamdulillah that's what God decided for it that's its place that will go there but the soul will not it's not destined for us and so the soul must become conscious of its true nature and its its place in the universe you know with in the divine and that's where this this uh, uh, divine discourse goes on this this meeting of between ourselves and our Lord that's what prayer is zikr and it's also in the meeting of of with other living beings it is it's a part when you meet another soul on the journey all the love that God has given you is now shown in your relationship with that person because we're, we have united for that purpose to become conscious of that love Barakallahu Fiki for such beautiful words for your insight and sharing your experience SubhanAllah, in this interview, I was constantly reminded of the essence of the message of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that it is possible to wake up while in this world. <laughs> La ilaha illallah. <laughs> Before, uh, inshallah, we officially conclude uh, this episode, would you mind uh, making a short dua? SubhanAllah. Walhamdulillahi wa la ilaha illallah wallahu akbar wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billahi wa huwa al-aliyyul azim O Allah beloved 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 Purify our hearts and souls and our bodies and minds that we may truly serve you, that we may fulfill the purpose for which you created us. Every step of our journey, we may, may we enter into your presence and give you everything we have that you have given us. We return to you all the blessings with our hearts filled with joy, that we may increase in our ibadah, that we may go to higher and deeper levels of knowledge for your sake alone, that we may love one another for your sake alone, that we may serve you in serving each other, that we may assemble in the divine assembly as we were before we came to this world, but while we are in this world, that we may acknowledge what we said then. Surely you are our Lord, you will always be. We have no other existence but in you. By your light, by your love do we exist. In your light and in your love do we exist. May we walk in the footsteps of the holy prophets. <coughs> may the light of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam shine in our heart and shine through us and may the mercy that was sent through him to all the worlds before existence and forever be our guiding spirit be the light that guides us on this journey may this world and all worlds be transformed by the mercy of your love inshallah we know that you did not create us in vain, but for a beautiful, holy, 
and infinitely significant purpose, and we want to join together with each other to be servants of your beautiful truth, your divine plan. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadin Asabikil alawami Anwarahu mila samawati Sallallahu alayhi wa la alihi wa sabihi Adadan rimali wa adadan nujuma sama Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad Asabikil alawami Anwarahu mila samawati Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sabihi Adadan rimali wa adadan nujuma sama Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadin Asabi kill alawami Anwarahu mila samawati Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sabihi Adadan rimali wa adadan nujuma sama Subhana Rabika Rabil Azati Amayasifun Wasalamun Alal Mursaleen Walhamdulillahi Rabil Alameen Amin Amin Ya Rabil Alameen Allahumma ameen, Allahumma ameen. May Allah taqabbal minna. May Allah accept our prayers, our dua. Alhamdulillah, wa shukrullah. This concludes this episode. We would like to thank all of the listeners from all over the world. If you would like to connect with Sheikha Maryam Kabir Fay, you can reach out to her via email. Her email is baraka at verizon.net. That is B-A-R-A-K-A-H at verizon.net. And that's V-E-R-I-Z-O-N dot net. She's open to hear your salams, but she wants to network. She wants to build with you. She wants to hear from you. So you're open to that, alhamdulillah. We will also include a link, inshallah, to her book, her autobiography, Journey Through 10,000 Veils. We will make that link available in the episode summary, which will be accessed from our website, soulofislamradio.com, via iTunes, many of the services such as Stitcher, TuneIn, as well as our Facebook page. And to all of the seekers and lovers of the divine, we here at the Soul of Islam Radio highly recommend that you get a copy of this autobiography. It is so fruitful, alhamdulillah. To continue supporting the Soul of Islam radio, please do the following. Like our page on facebook.com forward slash soul of Islam radio. Make sure to subscribe. Please give us a review and a rating in iTunes or any of the services that you may come across. And recommend to your family and friends. Please visit our website at soulofislamradio.com. There you'll find a free multimedia course to help you rediscover the spiritual dimension of Islam, as well as subscription links to services such as iTunes, Stitcher, and TuneIn. You'll also find links to our personal blogs and social media profiles, and a form for you, the listeners, to send in any feedback or suggestions you have for future episodes. And with that, may the peace, the mercy, and the light of the divine be upon you all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.